This episode is a business transition journey about a physical therapist who transitioned into being a medical writer and consultant. Caitlin Tivy is our guest today. She helps femtech, women's health, and LGBTQ plus health companies develop clinically and scientifically accurate information and products through clinical consulting, content development, and medical review. She started her career in biomedical research, but pivoted away from academia after two years. She earned her DPT in 2016 from the University of Colorado, Denver, and completed a residency in orthopedic manual physical therapy in 2017. She practiced in outpatient orthopedics and pelvic health for about four years before starting investing in alternative career paths. Welcome to the show, Caitlin. Thanks so much for having me, Tanner. It'd be fun to be here. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. And where to begin here? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> there is a lot, right? It's quite a journey. Totally. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> Let's start off with earlier in the beginning of the career journey where, you know, you're in a traditional patient clinical rehab role and discuss maybe some of the points where you had the sense that or the first sense of awareness that things weren't quite right in your your rehab career? Gosh, I think, I feel like this this story is so common to so many rehab specialists and all disciplines that I talk to that it just starts really slowly, I think, for a lot of us because we get our degree and we put in all this effort to get our DPT or our OT degree or what have you. And then we're finally there. We've made it, right? So we start working and we're really in the weeds for a while, especially those first few years. You're just getting your feet under you. You still feel like you barely know what you're doing, even though we're so educated, right? But there's often, even in those early years for some of us, there's often just something that feels a little off. And for me, I think a lot of it was how exhausted I felt at the end of every day. And I made a lot of excuses for that for a long time. I was like, well, it's just residency. Residency is really hard. You'll get through it. When you're done with residency, it'll get easier. And then I got out of residency and started working at a private practice back home here in Colorado. And it kept happening. It's like, well, maybe it's just getting into this new practice. You know, maybe I'm just settling into a new community and building my caseload and it'll get better. And then a couple of years later, still happening, right? I'm coming home every day and I enjoyed a lot of moments in the day, but at the end of every day, I just felt like a deflated balloon, just exhausted no matter how hard I tried to manage my time and take breaks and, you know, all the strategies so many of us use. So I think that was one of the first signs for me. And I didn't have a word for it at the time, but it was sort of my social batteries being completely drained by just having to be on all day long. There were other things too. I mean, all of us know the struggle of having to take documentation home and having to work maybe some extra hours on the weekend because we're trying to pay off our loans and all these things that add up. But for me, the exhaustion and the feeling of having no social battery left for the rest of my life was the first indicator that uh, maybe full-time clinical care is is not right for me. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you're right 100%. That happens to a lot of people that it, it's really like you have this fight or flight response that's just on all the time. Totally. <laughs> and it's completely unhealthy. I've had some autoimmune stuff happen for prolonged periods of time. And it's just, hey, guys, this is a sign. This isn't working. <laughs> Something needs to change, right? And it's ironic because we're educating our patients about that too, right? Especially if we work in orthopedics, all the pain science is around fight or flight and we're learning more about trauma-informed care and the same problems, right? But mm -hmm. we're talking to patients about it. And meanwhile, we're living it ourselves. So yeah, totally, totally feel you there. For sure. For you, was there like a specific moment that you realized, man, I'm just, I'm not going to do this clinical care anymore, this treatment? Or was it just, you mentioned the gradual, it all just built up and then you realized there was no specific moment necessarily. What was that like for you? I don't know if there was one moment, but there was definitely a time frame of a few months, late 2019, early 2020, I think, where I was becoming more and more dissatisfied and all of the compounding things that had been building up were really coming to a head. And in early 2020, right around the time the pandemic was breaking out, but even a little before, I started investigating 
more work related to writing. And I'd always enjoyed writing. I'd always been a good reader and writing always came naturally to me. And I don't even remember how I happened upon a course, but I found this course called Breaking Into Health Writing online. And the woman who created it was doing a promotion. And I was like, all right, this is this is on sale. I'll grab it and I'll work on this. I started working on it in clinic during the pandemic when we had you know, open slots because my clinic never closed. We had to keep seeing people because we're in a rural area. So we were sort of a safety net, but our caseload was down. So when I had breaks, I would work on this course. Then I started doing some writing for clients and I got pretty lucky with pitching some early clients that just jumped on it. And we're like, yeah, we'd love to have you write some educational content for us, for our patients. And I think in those few months, as I was starting to write for clients more, I realized the time that I was spending writing because it was usually early mornings before work or afternoons after I got home. I didn't feel like work in the same way that the clinic did. And that those few months, I think, is when it started to click. Like, oh, maybe there are other options out there. And maybe you aren't stuck in the clinic full time forever. So I think it was somewhat gradual, but it really coalesced over those few months when I really jumped into to doing more writing. For sure. Would you say, was that the first sense of awareness that you felt that this could actually be a legitimate career, generate some income to live off of path? You know, I wish I could say yes, but I, I didn't believe it for a long time. <laughs> I was like, this is just a side gig. This is for fun and for a little extra play money. You know, I was moonlighting as a writer for three years, a little over three years before I decided to go full time for myself. And I worked for a telehealth company during that time. So I was doing a lot of other stuff, but I never thought that writing and consulting and some of the work I do now could be full time. That took a while. Let's just slide into that. Okay. So what I'm thinking is you were working in med tech for a bit, and then it sounds like some writing was sprinkled in there. And then eventually it got to a point where it was, okay, yeah, this can be a business. So let's let's start at the beginning with the med tech stuff. How did you land that? Because that's a big topic right now. A lot of people are, get me out of clinical care, get me into med tech. So was that a full-time role? How did you land it? Was it a good fit? Yeah. I started working for this telehealth company in spring of 2021. And it was funny because for the last year, roughly, I had been already doing some writing and knew that I wanted to do something different than the clinic I was in, but I wasn't sure what. And I think I applied for the role that was posted months prior and totally forgot about it. <laughs> and then I got a phone call one day from a recruiter from this company. It's like, hey, we'd love to talk to you. Oh, great. I totally spaced this. And that interview process went pretty quickly. And I remember sitting down with my partner and thinking, is this smart? Do I do this? I don't know. But I went through, I think, three or four rounds of interviews with them and got a decently good feeling. So I accepted that job in April or May, I think, and jumped into that. There's a lot of different words. There's med tech, telehealth, health tech, all these buzzwords, right? This company, the job I applied for was a telehealth PT role. It was still clinical in a way. I was still going to be interfacing with patients or as we call them members, but I was still talking to people all day long, essentially. But I, I saw the job as a way to just bridge out of in-person clinical care. So I jumped on it. And then during my time there, about halfway through the first year, I was recruited by a colleague another PT in the company, because this company I was working for was an MSK focused, very knee pain, back pain. How do we help people do essentially PT from their home using technology? But they were starting to build their women's health branch. They wanted to branch out. So my colleague who had been brought into that team reached out to me and said, hey, I know you do some writing on the side. I think she'd seen it on my LinkedIn and stuff like that. Are you interested in helping me with a couple side projects for this women's health vertical that we're building? And I was like, oh, heck yeah, that sounds great. So that was very much by happenstance. I think I sort of helped myself into that role by volunteering to be a mentor for other PTs on the team that were starting to see some pelvic health concerns and had no idea and they were panicking, you know? Typical orthopedic, like, hey, we don't talk about the pelvic floor, it's scary, right? So there was a transition period where some of the ortho PTs had to take a little bit of that and they were nervous. So I had joined the mentorship team and that probably helped put me on the radar for my colleague who brought me in. But I jumped on that opportunity and started doing some help, some work helping her build out the women's health platform. The thing about startups for those listeners that maybe don't have as much experience or know is you wear all the hats all the time and you pretty much never have a title to reflect that and usually not pay to reflect that either. 
you will be brought into lots of different projects and you got to really advocate for yourself because it's really easy to end up doing a lot of extra work outside of your job description for months without ever, you know, transitioning into a new role. So that was part of the challenge there. But I worked in building that program with them for several months and then eventually hit a wall with that company in spring of 2023. They wanted to move me back into a clinical facing, patient facing role. After I'd spent months just developing this program, doing a ton of writing, doing a ton of brainstorming and big project based work, which I loved. And, uh, and I had sat down with my boss's boss essentially several times and been like, I love what we're building with this. I want to be involved. I want to be part of the clinical development team. I'll lay out this path for you. Here's how I can help. Did the whole thing. It just wasn't right for them at the time or what they wanted or what they saw as possible. So they started pushing me back into this clinical role and I hated it. (laughs) I was not happy. So, you know, I mean, we've all been there, right? We just, you know, grin and bear it. But I spent several months doing my best and really trying to, to make it work, hoping that eventually my moment would come, but it never really did. Mm -hmm. So that's when I made the decision to leave that company last spring, a little over a year ago. And then things all went crazy from there. (laughs) But that's that that's the the health tech side of things. Okay, so it went crazy. What (laughs) what happened exactly? Yeah, gosh, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of your listeners can identify with a lot of us in these roles are all type A, you know, we like to have a plan, we like to know what's gonna happen, right? I had never left a job in my life without having something planned for the next week, you know, to start a new job. So that was terrifying for me, but I I knew I needed to do it for my sanity. My partner made a joke just a few weeks ago. I was like, hey, Caitlin, you haven't cried about work in like six months. I was like, yeah. (laughs) So that was a good sign. I, I knew it was time, right? But it was scary. So I left in May when I said, no, you're gonna spend the next two to three months taking some continuing education, dipping your feet in other things, and applying for lots of jobs. And I was applying mostly for medical writing jobs at the time. And medical writing is a really complex and deep field, but I had enjoyed what I was doing with my side hustle and working at the startup doing writing. So I was like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. In a pretty good portfolio at the time. I was like, all right, I can do this. And I spent the whole summer, I took a certification course through the American Medical Writers Association. I did a lot, a bunch of LinkedIn courses on project management and other general, more business type skills. And I applied for every job under the sun and got nowhere. How long did you do that for? And if you don't mind sharing, how many jobs did you apply for? Yeah, gosh. I kept count for a while and eventually I got tired of counting. I know it was upwards of a hundred. It was probably closer to 200. And I was doing this basically from May until middle of July. I did have one job that I got through. It was more of a policy writing role for a health company, another health tech company. It was more on the insurance-based side. And I got through five rounds of interviews with them and then they went with somebody else. So that was unfortunate. (laughs) And I think that was the breaking point. At least at that time, the market was pretty saturated. These were all remote roles too. I live in a rural area of Colorado. My partner's business is here. We have no interest in moving or really ability to. So we I didn't want to relocate. But the remote workforce job market is really saturated because a lot of people want those roles. And post-COVID, a lot of companies are moving away from them, right? And after about two and a half, three months of that, I thought to myself, you're spinning your wheels, right? I just felt like a hamster on a wheel and trying to get an application in two minutes after it appeared online. You know, just that rush was that hustle feeling all the time was too much. So that's around the time that I realized Maybe I look at doing something for myself and starting my own business, which I'd never really considered before. So it was end of last summer that I jumped into my own business after getting nowhere with job applications. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about maybe six months before you decided to go full time with this writing and consultant. What was all that like? And how did you get it all together to officially go full time? I've never been someone who thought of myself as an entrepreneur. And I always said, I never want to own a business. I'm a workaholic. I'll work myself to death. And I, you know, my partner owns his own business. I've watched how much he does and how challenging it is for him. And I've watched other people in my life run businesses. And it's not easy, but there are bonuses for sure. And I just sort of fell into it because of this cycle of I'm getting nowhere with applying for traditional jobs. What are my options? The previous months, I mean, I had spent three and a half years at this point doing a lot of writing and a lot of it was medical content. 
a ton of educational content for, you know, patients who might be Googling, what can I do for pelvic organ prolapse? So I had laid a foundation. I built a portfolio of work over many months and I just sort of automatically been staging my work on an online portfolio for years already because it was helpful when I was talking to new clients. Like, yeah. And here are some examples of what I can do. So I had that in place, but I didn't have a lot of other stuff in place. Honestly, I had taken, like I mentioned, a project management course on LinkedIn and that helped me with some organizational mindset that I hadn't really used before. But when I decided to go full time in basically July and give myself some time to make my own business, I had come across already a company, they're called Prospology, and it's a company that's focused on helping healthcare professionals who want to become freelance medical writers. My work has evolved a little bit beyond writing now, which we can talk about. But at the time, I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can't get hired but anywhere to medical, be a medical writer. So how can I be a freelancer? How can I market myself? So I joined a short-term four-month program with that company, Prospology, to help me get in more of a business mindset. And that was really helpful during those early months. But I'll be honest, it's been a lot of trial and error and learning on the fly. <laughs> There's not always a way to be like 100% prepared. And something I'll say too, it's it's almost, I don't know if it's the human condition or it's just really impossible to be 100% prepared for everything that you come across as a business owner. But when those opportunities come and they're right in front of you, it's okay. Now is definitely the time I need to get my stuff together and totally get, and get this all locked in. And then it'll grow and evolve. That's something I've learned too on its own as time goes by, because it can easily be, Oh no, this isn't ready yet because analysis paralysis is not perfect. I can't exactly. share it. I can't post it. You got to do your best and go with totally. it. And then it just grows as you go. But. Totally. And it's funny, Tater. I think we as, as PTs and, you know, OTs and SLPs, we're, we're really good at thinking on our feet. We just don't give ourselves credit for that, right? Because when you think about how creative a PT, for example, has to be in the clinic every day to change what they're offering or prescribing or treat or how they're treating based on the individual person in front of them. We do that all the time without even thinking about it. But for some reason, we have a little, a lot of us, I can't say for everyone, but a lot of us have a mental block thinking, oh, we can only do that in this setting, right? But we're pretty natural innovators and creative thinkers. And I love what you said about the analysis paralysis. I mean, I'm thinking back to grad school and how many times our professors would say, just fake it till you make it. You're going to figure it out. <laughs> and you do, right? You do that in clinical care. And the same thing applies in other endeavors do business. 100%. I think the same thing happens if you venture down... I mean, the freelance, entrepreneurial business, any of that route, it's you're never going to feel 100% about all of it. You just got to go with it, you know? Exactly. I think that's one of the things I learned from the startup world, too, is they are always building the ship as they're sailing it or building the plane as they're flying it, as I think of the, the common term, which is scary in the healthcare space. But that mindset, tempered by my medical background and my caution there, those two together... I think made me a little bit more willing to take some chances and try things. For sure. I got a couple of questions for you. The time six months before going full time to going full time, was there a really big challenge or frustration that you had during that time? And how did you overcome that? Every day, honestly. <laughs> I, I still joke. People will ask me, like, how's your work going? I'm like, well, it depends on the day. I think Personally, for me, the income insecurity is the hardest thing to get used to is, you know, and that's something I'm working on with a business coach about like how to make for the long run, how to make income as a freelancer more consistent. Because when you're used to being salaried, it's very different. I have a lot of personal hangups around money and, you know, fear of financial ruin and all this dramatic stuff. So that that mental component was the biggest challenge for me of being, well, I might make a thousand dollars this month, but the next month I might make three. And, uh, you, you know, so getting used to the insecurity and the variability was, is a constant challenge that I still face today. I'm lucky that I don't have dependents. We don't have a mortgage. I don't have kids. It's just my partner and I. So I have more flexibility, I think, than others, but it's still scary. And I think last fall, especially. So I, I officially incorporated my business at the end of July, even though I'd been, you know, working underneath it sort of already. And. Little, little did I realize <laughs> 2023 was going to be a historically bad year for the freelance market in general, and especially in my area. Just a lot of things were coming together between the economy being still questionable and 
I was marketing to a lot of startups and startups were having a really hard time last year. I can see that now, but in the moment I was really in the weeds. And in November and December, especially, I felt like I was getting nowhere. I was pitching to so many different clients, trying to find more clientele because I had some clients that were putting work on pause for various financial reasons on their side. I also didn't know at the time that December, especially, at least in the medical writing world, is the whole month is just gone. People are in vacation mode and n- no new work is coming in. And I know that now I can plan ahead, but I didn't then. Those months in late fall where I was just banging my head against a wall and struggling to find clients, there was a lot of that imposter syndrome. Like, am I not good enough? Do people not like my work? Why are these other freelancers I see out there? Why are they doing well? Why aren't I? Those moments happen a lot. I think a solace for me was following a lot of other people in various freelancing roles Especially there's a few out there that really keep it real. And they talk about the the reality of working for yourself and freelancing and how it is a lot of up and down. So that helped keep me sane during those periods. But it's still challenging when you're like, how am I going to pay the bills this month? And it's it's scary, uh, to be honest. But there's a lot of rewards that make up for that. So (laughs) For sure. You just started going full-time in July 2023, right? So, you know, maybe this hasn't happened yet, but have you ever been in a situation where it's like, man... I don't know if this is going to work long term. Oh, Should yeah. I throw in the towel and do something different or keep trying to grow and build this thing? What was that like if you had that experience and what made you decide to keep going? Yeah. So last fall was a real reckoning point. Those couple months where things really slowed down and I wasn't sure why and didn't have yet have the perspective to understand that it wasn't me. So during the time I didn't throw in the towel totally on my business, but I did panic apply for a few clinical roles. Because I was like, well, if this if this continues in January, I'm going to have to go full time again. There's no way. And luckily, things have picked up this year, thank goodness. And some of my work that I've been putting in last year is coming to fruition finally. But I did, I did take a very, very part time PR and role at a local hospital. It's very flexible. I can basically pick the days that I want, and I'm pretty much never going to do more than one day a week for more than a few weeks at a time. So it's very sporadic, which is nice. And I'm going to keep it for a while because when slumps happen, I can lean on that. I also still see a handful of patients at a local clinic right down the street so I can pick up more people there when things get slow. So I didn't give up. I didn't take a full-time clinical role and say, screw this business. I'm never looking at it again. But I did take out an insurance policy, if that makes sense, to have something to fall back on when times get slow. But I've had several of those reckoning moments. When I initially started the business, I said, okay, I'm going to give myself six months and I'm going to reevaluate in February and see where I'm at. I'm going to look at my finances and say, is this going to work long term? How is my business doing? I chose that number kind of arbitrarily, honestly. (laughs) Now that I'm talking to more and more, working with more business people and working with a business coach and talking to people that have built their own businesses more, I realize that six months is not a great metric for is your business going to succeed? It's got to be longer than that. But I didn't know at the time. So I'm working on a quarterly check-in system with myself right now and trying to sort of systematize that. But I'm not going to make any rash decisions every three months because things change so much. And it might be a few years before I have a profitability from the business, and that's fine. But that's something I've learned along the way. And I have these backup options behind me now to make me feel a little safer. Yeah, I was finishing up a blog post writing for Next Degree with John, who will come on. And something that I put in there was I had actually both two things to talk about, one for each of what you just said. And so the building businesses over time was what I included because I talk about side hustles and my PT or my podcasting journey in the blog post. And I talk about how long it takes on average to create a successful online business. Like in the podcast space, I think average is like four years. Well, a lot of entrepreneurs say three to five. The first two years, you're just figuring stuff out and trying to build up whatever it is, your product and service and get the revenue stream going. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, man. It's like, it's a real risk. It's it's a real risk reward thing. You're going to have to risk it and it may not work out. But the idea is, is, it's aligned ideally with what you want to do or a skill set you want to learn or people you want to learn from. And so when it's all done, you either A, have all that that network and those relationships and those connections, and or B, you've developed a skill set by going down that route that you can ideally pivot and use in something else. And the other thing with the insurance policy, I think it's a great idea. 
There's like some of the med tech things that are coming in with Luna therapy. They're only offering it for physical therapists, but they currently, but they're working on speech path and OT as well. And it's an app where you can just go on and see to like do home health. I'm pretty sure it's part B in the, your local areas. And you can just get on the app and see what's available. So things are changing. Ideally, it's going to be a little bit easier, hopefully, for us to have maybe a little bit of side insurance on the side to where it's okay. If I am slow on the business, I can pick up this with this new med tech stuff. So we've talked about some of the scary stuff about being business owners and entrepreneurs. What do you love most about your new reality? A lot of things. And I try to really keep it real because there's so many business influencers and stuff out there that are like, I made 100K in six months. Great. Good for you. You're one of the 1%. Right. So I, and I'm really honest about it. Like, yeah, I have panic moments. Totally. It's scary, but I don't want to underplay the things that I love about this work too. So, so glad you asked, asked about that. The flexibility and the autonomy, I think are the biggest things for me. I learned pretty quickly, especially in the startup environment that I was in, that company grew really fast while I was there. And it went from being pretty small, scrappy startup vibes when I started to becoming way more corporate. I cannot tolerate. And that quickly showed me, you know, you're not really made for big corporate America, Caitlin. (laughs) You're a little too, you're a little too independent for that. And that was fine. It was a learning journey for me. But because I'm working for myself, I don't have to deal with that. And I have a lot of my own autonomy to make my own schedule and figure out when I want to work, when I work best, which clients I want to work with. And that does take time. I'm not going to create any illusions that a lot of times in the beginning, you're taking any work you can get. That's normal. But you get to become more picky over time. But the fact that I get to choose and I don't have anybody staring over my shoulder and micromanaging me makes all the difference. And I made the joke earlier that I'm, you know, workaholic and I'll, you know, work my tail off. But I think a lot of us are in some ways. And you have to keep that in check. But I had the moment where I sat with myself and said, Caitlin, this is part of your personality. You were always going to give 110% and you cannot turn that off. So if you're always going to give 110%, is it worth it giving it to yourself in your business or giving it to someone else who's paying you a portion of probably what you are actually making for them, right? 100%. I wish I could click a fire emoji and have (laughs) the fire emoji. (laughs) Totally. That's how I feel every day. Just light light it on fire. (laughs) Yeah. Like I 100% agree with everything you just said. A lot of people I've talked to that have businesses have said the same thing. And on these journeys where we're like reach a breaking point, so to speak, of man, I just can't do traditional clinical care anymore at least for me too, is why am I giving all of this to somebody else? And that's what's crazy about corporations and huge companies. It's like this thing that's, it's like this huge corporation of many people. It's not like you're talking to the name of this business and it's a person and they can understand and see where you're coming from. There's so much hierarchy and I'm just going to say BS, like that totally. gets involved when it gets so big. And it's why am I why am I sacrificing my health literally for this? And it makes that investing in yourself and potentially going down a business route or entrepreneurial route or freelance route, whatever, more realistic. Okay, I've had enough of this. Let's let's go try something different. Exactly. I mean, the breaking point is a real thing. And for me, I knew when I left my job at the startup. I had a call with the person I directly reported to who wasn't a clinician herself, but she was very emotionally intelligent. And I I I liked her a lot and and liked working with her. And the first thing she said to me, I put in my notice on Friday and we had met on Monday and we got on this call and she said, you look better. Oh, is it that obvious? Probably was because I had cried on a call with her a couple of weeks before. (laughs) But she's like, you look like a weight has lifted off your shoulders. And yeah, I have no idea what I'm going to do next, but I know I don't belong here in this corporate space. So thank you for understanding. And she, I was lucky she was great about it. But people can tell when you're just surviving instead of being true to yourself. Yeah, I want to share a little story too that really is the same example of what we're talking about here. Something that I never thought as a possibility that could happen that is a potential of happening is if you're in a a position long term that you don't like, it's going to wear on you and it's going to change a little bit your personality and make you irritable. And like you said, people are going to notice and it's going to reflect on your patience and that customer service and the overall quality of care. You know, you maybe have a good relationship with your manager and be like, hey, 
this isn't sustainable. I can't do this long term. This isn't working. They might be like, yeah, it's going to be okay. It's just this long or we're going to get somebody, whatever. You may find yourself in a situation where it actually doesn't get better. There is no help coming and you're just stuck biting the bullet until a later date than what you thought. Exactly. This can really affect the overall quality of care for everybody involved and even the reputation of the company you're working for. You know, when you like have some clear water or a pool and you drop a rock or pebble in it and it just starts and the waves start going. Yeah. It's kind of like that, that point where it's this may not be that big of a thing right now, but it can grow into something much larger. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's really tough because everybody's stuck between a rock and a hard place and you just kind of never know how it's going to turn out. But I just never thought that something like that would would happen. And it's it's definitely a possibility. So I think it's important, like you said, to know when it's time to go and know when it's time to leave and ideally be able to set yourself up to make that jump, even if you don't have all the answers quite figured out yet. 100%. You really hit the nail on the head for something that I've been thinking about a lot during this transition, because there's a lot, I think, talk in the space of any medical or healthcare professional that leads a profession. A lot of us are still working in healthcare adjacent roles. So we're still making a difference in that area. But there's so much guilt that a lot of us feel for leaving patient care, whether it's am I wasting my degree or am I abandoning my patients, whatever it is. But what you said, at some point, you could actually be doing your patients more harm because you weren't there. You weren't engaged. Your brain is firing at about 10% of its capacity. I mean, we know the system is broken. It's probably not working well for just about anybody. But for those of us that are really feeling that this is not right for me, you aren't abandoning your patients. You're probably doing them a service by finding something that you succeed in more and flourish in more. So there's many ways to to help somebody other than direct patient care. And Let's take this topic to the next level. You know, you were talking about the quality of care between you and the patient and your overall health. And it's that rippling effect that if things aren't fixed and they sustain in this bad quality of care relationship, mental status, then are those patients going to want to come work with you? No, they probably are. And so technically you can build a bad rapport and a bad reputation by being in this environment. And technically, if the patients don't want to come see you in your company, then your coworkers may actually lose out on potential seeing patients too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's this thing that can really blow up. I just wanted to put that out there that it's not just necessarily always you and the patient. There's your coworkers and like other people involved that it can get to. And you could burn bridges with your coworkers too. You never know if that person that you've been working next to could be a referral source for you 10 years down the line. And you don't want to ruin that relationship either. That's true. What is obvious to you now that maybe you struggled to see in the moment when you were working in the traditional patient clinical role? On a personal level, it's that I'm truly an introvert, which people, when I tell people that, they're like, no, you're not. You're the friendliest, chattiest, bubbliest person. The best definition I've seen is that an extrovert is someone that is energized by being around people. An introvert is someone that is drained by being around people and needs time to themselves to recover. I still love people. I'm not not a per people person. I enjoy seeing, I enjoy social events. I enjoy you know interacting with people, but I need that time to recharge that social battery that I was talking about. A lot of times in-person clinical care is not made for folks like me that just feel that sense of exhaustion at the end of every day from giving everything. From a personal level, that was the realization I had. You know, you're really not built and wired for something that makes you be on to this level every single day. It's not you, Caitlin. You're not broken. You're just not the right fit for this role and it isn't the right fit for you. For sure. How did you figure that out? Was that in a transition phase outside of a traditional clinical role into jumping out into trying to do the freelance into a business stage thing? I think it really dawned on me because I've mentioned before, I was afraid that I was going to be a workaholic and that I would never look up from my work. And, you know, that hasn't totally come, that hasn't come to fruition. I've been better about regulating than I need to be or than I, than I thought I would be, I should say. But I think I really realized I can sit at my computer and work 10 or 12 hours in a day on my 
consulting work, my writing, my building my business, building my website, whatever. And then when I'm done, I'm like, oh, that, I'm just done. I feel fine. I'm going to go, you know, ride my bike now. It's fine. If I had worked six hours in a clinic, I would feel wrecked. Yeah. And that, like you said, just being aware of, well, okay, you know, you don't like this, but being aware of what you do like and then kind of gravitating towards that. So that makes sense. Totally. And I still love, I love the science behind rehab. I love talking about pelvic health and women's health. That is so interesting to me. I just don't necessarily want to do it to individual patients one at a time. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a better fit for you and who you are. All right, Kaylin. So wrapping up here, there's something that you like to share with listeners who, you know, maybe in a similar situation or situations and want to transition to possibly doing some freelance stuff or taking their freelance side gig to the next level thing. There's so many cliches. I think you can do it and, you know, believe in yourself. I'm not going to give any of those, but I think having, even for some, I was just spent all this time talking about what an introvert I am, but even for those of us that are sort of, you know, self-driven introvert, we need support and networks. And it was really important to me when I went into business for myself that I not put all of that on my partner either, because he has his own stresses and his business. And I can't rely on him to be my, you know, I can vent to him anytime, but I don't want to be layering all my stress on him. And I don't want to be, you know, calling up my parents and laying all my stress on them either. You know, I, I want to keep some separation between my work and my my loved ones. So I really was intentional about building a network of people that I can complain to and talk and be real with, but also be supportive of. So I have several networks that I'm in. I have a group of other women who are freelancers, mostly in in writing space. We're a Slack channel together and we can chit chat. It's like a little co-working space. So if we need a break, we can go, you know, meme at each other there. And we can also ask for input and ask for vibe checks, if you will, <laughs> is so we can really keep it, keep it real in that space. Working with the Prosphology program for four months was great because I got to, again, talk through these questions that I maybe thought were stupid, never were. But I'm afraid to ask these to, you know, a client or someone that I'm trying to impress, but I can ask these to my business colleagues in this, in this group. And I'm starting another business coaching program next week with a different group just to change it up. And again, having that network of people that I can bounce ideas off, whether it's just to vent or whether it's to ask very specific, how do I get over this hurdle? Having little groups of people everywhere that I can rely on for different questions has made all the difference, especially when I'm you know, in panic mode or stuck in the weeds on a problem. Yeah, 100% agree. I've been in a mastermind group of online entrepreneurs since covid and it's been a great experience. I don't think I'd be where I'm at. And it's like you're saying, it doesn't really sound like a lot, but just having a group of people to ask, am I doing this right? What do you guys think about this? I, I've never done this before. It's just a huge just help of getting through the journey. And also something I want to share is something Rio Rebels is starting to do is actually we are beta testing a mastermind group for rehab clinic owners. So we have private practice owners that own their own clinics. They see patients and see how that goes. But I really want to open it up at some point to online entrepreneurs, likely in just the health space. So yeah, we'll see. It's all a learning growing project and see how it goes. But I love that. Yeah. People are starved for community still. I mean, I know we're post COVID, but I think there's a hangover from that or people are really interested in building those communities in this digital age. So I love that you're creating that space to help people with exactly exactly this this issue. How do I stay grounded with real human beings that can check me when I'm going crazy? <laughs> For sure, right? That support and accountability. Totally. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for taking time to come on and be on the show and share your story. It's been great. So thank you so much for having me. It's been great talking about it.